it's going out there? It's November 3rd. I'm Frank Kersey, host of the Wall Street Unplugged podcast, where I break down headlines and... Uh, tell you what's really moving these markets. So, Daniel, fresh back from Ohio. I feel like you're taking a trip like, uh, you know, every week nowadays, right? You're going away. Your boss must pay you pretty well, but I feel like every time I talk to you, you're going away. He must. It's it's a leverage opportunity I got going here. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, Arizona a couple weeks ago, maybe a month, time flies, and then quick trip up to Ohio to visit family. I surprised my nephew for his birthday, so that was fun. I have a niece and a nephew, and it was fantastic because... My nephew couldn't have been more excited to see me, and my niece, who's three, could care less. And I just love how genuine and funny kids are. They're just straightforward. There's no BS. <laughs> she just waves, hey, how are you? Yeah. No, that's cool. That's cool. How, how, was, uh, how was the airlines? You didn't fly American, did you? I know they canceled like a million flights and, and like Southwest, <laughs> hopefully. Well, no, I didn't. Uh, I was on Allegiant, discount airliner, so a lot of people are probably going to take some shots on that. But it was amazing. I bought my ticket uh, a little bit less than a week in advance. All in for two hundred and twelve bucks. I'm pretty sure it was two hundred and twelve dollars on the on the penny mm -hmm. to the dot, and uh, even paid extra twenty some dollars for leg room for exit rows since I am uh, about six six and airplanes are very uncomfortable, to be frank. But uh, I'll tell you one quick thing. I'm in the security line. Well, and I, I said this when I had to fly during COVID when when COVID was new and and the airliners really were were tanking and slow. Um, I don't know when the last time you flew, Frank, but the security lines, everything is much easier because you obviously have less people. I haven't been to Atlanta a lot. I have some friends that fly in out of Atlanta a lot. You know, at times it's, it's busier than normal, but I'm going through the switchbacks in the security line and it was moving fine. And what do I see, Frank? I see a couple and this guy comes at me and we kind of make eye contact because we're right next to each other. And he's got this army green t-shirt with a huge American flag and it says, let's go Brandon. And uh, even with my mask on, you could tell, and several people stopped him to just, you know, say they liked his shirt and all that kind of stuff. Uh, for all you listeners out there, Frank, are you familiar with this Let's Go Brandon of thing? Of course. I think I, yeah, of course. I think well, most people are, yeah. hell, it was number one on iTunes with uh, <laughs> some, uh, a rap song came yeah, out about yeah, it. Yeah, it, it went is. Viral. Yep. I mean, just hilarious. But uh, that's a fun little segue into uh, politics and crazy thing. So I get on the airplane. I have an exit row. Uh, in, a, in an aisle seat and this guy and his wife go by it's, this shirt's walking at me and he's like hey funny seeing you again I'm sitting in the window we didn't talk a whole lot but it was just hilarious like I mean f regardless of your beliefs in politics like I'm very strong will and strong minded and I don't even wear shirts like that so mm -hmm. it always always have to give a tip of the hat with uh, when I see stuff like that but that made me laugh out loud that was pretty good yeah yeah I mean uh, you know a lot going on even with politics we saw a big election in, in Virginia and you know Again, I don't, I don't want to go too much into politics here, but uh, I think the biggest thing it, we're realizing is, and I know the Democrats ha had a partner with the left, right, in order to, to, to beat Trump, but now with the left, with the defund the police and especially critical race theory, I think this is a big shot where we're letting the parents speak, where they always say, if you're a politician, the one thing you can't do is F the intern, right? So you can do anything, you can lie, you can cheat, you can fall asleep, you can do whatever you want as president, but that's you know the worst thing that you could do. Uh, when it comes to, to everything else, I mean, you could deal with, and I guess people are dealing with a lot of shit going on in this country. The one thing they won't deal with it is telling your kids uh, and how to teach them and what you're doing. And that's big. There's a lot of parents out there speaking about that. I'm, I'm firsthand knowledge of that where I moved my I went to the full extreme and moved out of uh, public school, I believe in the public school systems, to one of the most expensive private schools. That's how far away I wanted to be, which, you know, again, I'm paying for it right now. But, uh, you know, teaching kids how to hate each other and things like that and, and seeing it firsthand where, you know, girls picking on my daughter and stuff for no reason uh, and a lot of this where, you know, the guy had CNN on. Did I tell you that? The guy had CNN on in the classroom. I don't care if he had Fox on. A C how do you have that on a classroom for, for seventh graders? Yeah, you mean any news in general. Like any news in yeah. general. Are sense. you kidding me? And, and especially the propaganda, all the garbage is being – take kids, teach them. Teach them English, history, teach whatever. Don't, don't, don't make up. You know, it, it, it's crazy because there's such an agenda out there. But man, uh, it, it, there's just a, a, a big calling out there when, when it comes to your kids. Again, I don't want to get too political at the beginning of this, but uh, you know, for me, uh, you look at that election; it's a clear sign. I don't care if you're Democrat, or Republican, but you know, critical race theory is shit. It's garbage. It's teaching kids how to hate each other. It's disgusting. Uh, and it needs to stop. I don't know who put this agenda in there and you're brainwashing kids and that's what kids do. You know, they're going to learn from whoever's teaching them at that beginning and, and carry that on for the rest of their lives. But man, that stuff's got to stop. And I think that was a big shot with, with the election where, you know, hopefully, I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican, but running on that kind of platform where that, you know, saying, you know, 
we should be able to teach your kids anything we want compared to no, 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 no. Okay. We have you there. These are our kids. These are our kids. Okay. And you teach them values that, that we don't agree with and that that's wrong. So anyway, probably get more emails off of what I just said there than anything, but go ahead. The big takeaway from the elections for me was, uh, obviously if you're a Republican, you're happier than Democrats in Virginia and it's close in New Jersey. I don't, close, yeah. I don't think that's still, uh, been announced. Mm-hmm. Uh, the coolest thing I seen, did you see the picture of the Lieutenant? I think it's the Lieutenant governor in Virginia. Um, and I don't have her name in front of me, but she has a picture. You talk about just a awesome, badass picture. If you have uh, it's on the front page of Zero Hedge, if you can pull it up. Mm-hmm. But she's in like a green coat, and she's holding this gun. I mean, and she is like, you look at it, it's just like, wow, that's a that's a <laughs> hell of a picture. Uh, but I, I listened to uh, about a seven-minute speech that she gave when she won. That was, that was pretty damn good. Yeah. Uh, the crazy thing for me is Biden won um, Virginia by, I think, 10 points during yeah. the presidential election. I think he won by even more in New Jersey. So that does shoot a uh, warning shot across the bow for Democrats. The takeaway for investors here is what does this do to the current bills being passed or negotiated and kind of debated right now? Yeah. You got the, uh, you know, call it one, two, one point two to two trillion um, stimulus or not stimulus, but bill going on right now, spending bill. And then that's kind of attached to this reconciliation thing. And you got this pushback between more progressives, more moderates, things like that. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So a little quick update here, Frank. I still think that. Democrats should wait to pass these bills until we get closer to midterms, which is still a year away. Uh, do you still think it benefits to pass them f- uh, sooner than later? And I mean, now they want to pass them sooner than later. It's going to be a lot easier, right? I mean, you come into, especially what happened with this election, I, I think it makes sense. But there's Democrats that are pushing back on the spending bill. Why do you think it would be easier now? Because as we go further, you're going to see much more inflation, and I think it's going to be a lot harder. Oh, I got you. Okay. Uh, and, and also, uh, Democrats have to be careful because some of them are going to be up for re-election, and, and people are going to be very careful what they're voting on right now, which could be called out. Because as every bill is, whatever side's passing, there's so much bullshit in there. Most of it, 85% of it's all bullshit. Uh, and what you're voting for right now, it's going to be called out during the midterm election. So you're probably better off passing it now or trying to, to, to push it through now than later. But a, a lot of this is inflationary. It's going to cause... You think it's bad now? Inflation is going to go through the roof. What, what infrastructure bill and all this stuff is going to be insane. Uh, and I think that's what, what some people see. I mean, I see it. I don't know why we can't get our, our goods any place, right? We, uh, the ports are still blocked up. You're I'm tracking this stuff uh, on a weekly basis, uh, giving you guys updates. If you notice, some of the companies are now saying 2023. Remember, we're supposed to be done. We're supposed to be done with that last quarter. Remember, the CEOs that lied about it. Now they're saying, well, probably through 2023, we might see this. So, you know, it is a big issue, and we'll see. We'll see what happens with the spending bill. But for right now, we have earnings, and man, it, it, it's pretty sick, right? I mentioned this on yesterday's podcast, a separation called the Great Separation, where, you know, you've just seen, like, companies in, in similar industries, some are reporting great numbers and some aren't, right? So there is a separation where when the market goes up and it's a bull market, and again, we are hitting highs. I think the Nasdaq's up, trying to go up today. Uh, it would be the ninth day in a row, I think, the Nasdaq's up, and 14 out of 15 for the S&P or something. Remember, like, just two weeks ago, we talked about, you know, big crash, and the world's going to end, and, and how everything changes, we're at all-time highs again. It's kind of funny how quick sentiment changes, but, you know, some of the earnings that came out, I mean, you got you to talk about Bed Bath & Beyond and Avis, right? Those are two, Daniel, right? Yeah, right at the top. Yeah, and this is, so Avis, we can take a victory lap, or Frank, you can. This was uh, this was solid pick um, for Avis budget during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, sent out an alert yesterday to sell half of a position. It, well, it's a huge winner. What, 1,500% or something ridiculous? Yeah, we I mean, recommend it, like That's 20s. amazing. And I don't mean to overlook that, but yeah. we got to talk about the price action because this yeah. is a good, you know, life is good right now for investors. Markets are melting up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think all indices are near time, all, all time highs. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the Fed upcoming in a minute. Bitcoin, cryptos are doing well. Bitcoin's damn near an all time high. Um, that's all well and good. And I don't, I don't want to rain on this parade, Frank, but I do want to call out something because the price action in car and bed, bath and beyond. So at one point car hit 500 and change 500 and it was, what did it open? It, so at it was up one, over 200% at one point during the day. Yes. During the day. During the day. It was one, it was a hundred. What did it open? 180. Uh, where, where would it close the day before when they reported earnings? They reported blowout earnings, yeah. right? And, and the stock did. was up what? Seven to 10% after, and then it opened up 20 and then it went from like 200 and, and low 200s to, I mean, what is it, 500 or something? Four, 500? <laughs> it went over 500. It yeah. went over 500. And, and, you know, you're seeing it now, it's down about 10, 15%. We sold half, you know, higher yesterday because, you know, a lot of this move is fake. 
And let's talk about that move. Exactly. And now I'm not smart enough to pinpoint this exactly, Frank, but the idea that you just, you have to keep this in the back of your mind when investing and you're, you're, you're looking at either, whether you're looking at long-term or short-term, but you know, with algorithms and most trading being automatic and no human beings at it, because if you stop and think who was buying this stock at 300, 350, 400, 450, I would argue algorithms and computers and, you know, quant systems or whatever, you know, your big hedge funds that uh, we've talked about in the past that are holding for, you know, seconds or any kind of thing like that. But as an individual investor, if you're in this name and you see these massive rips, do not be afraid to take some money off the table. Because just like we're seeing a pullback, I mean, it pulled back well off its highs yesterday. Now it's pulling back a little bit today. And I don't mean to badmouth the company um, or anything like that. It's just, this just shows you how when you flood the system, Frank, with tons and tons of money and it's just sloshing around, you're going to get a lot of craziness. So don't, don't feel like this is the new normal in the sense of, hey, this is going to go up and it's going to keep going up forever. Just don't be afraid to take some off the table as an investor. Yes. And I want to show you something. If you're on our YouTube page, I showed you if not explain to you. A lot of you guys listen to this through iTunes and stuff. Uh, but go to our YouTube page because you can see us bring up everything. Unfortunately, you got to look at both of our ugly faces. <laughs> well, my ugly face at least, right? <laughs> so I'm bringing up a chart right now and, and you see the Avis. And what it is, is this is Capital IQ. This is my system. Uh, again, this is we pay a lot of money for this. So... I like to bring up free sites, but this is important because you won't find this on a free site, but it's showing the other way you have the chart, the short interest. So this green line right here is a short interest and you're seeing it go down to around 10% in May and all of a sudden it starts going up starting September. So September is at 12% and then all of a sudden you're going up 15, 16, it's above 20% at, at roughly 20. So you look at 80% increase in the short interest leading up to this quarter, right? Uh, somebody what was really anticipating that these guys would come down. And rightly so, we watch this stock because you know, we recommended it in Curse of Venture Opportunities, and we were up 800% on it already, re recommended in the 20s, I believe. Uh, and, you know, this thing just kept taking off. And for me, like what you said, Dan, you want to take some off the table. You're right. Take some off the table, but don't take everything off the table because you don't know where this thing could go. And, and, you know, for us, we were like, all right, we knew the it would come down today because you have algorithms. And here's what happened, guys. You have short interest. Some guy's caught on the wrong side. So what is he doing? He, he's being forced to buy it as this thing goes higher. And as he's purchasing, it's going higher. Now, algorithms, what they do is just they front run the market. They see all these orders coming in. They get in like a second before them, which is inflating on the buy side or even the sell side if they're going if they're shorting. So now you see this massive move, and these guys keep trying to get out. Try to, I mean, somebody blew up in this mess, just like they blew up with, uh, with Bed Bath and Beyond. Same thing. Bed Bath and Beyond is a joke. I mean, I, I looked at the quarter where they announced, you know, the buyback program and stuff like that. I mean, and, and you're looking at, at, I don't know where it is today. It was up 80 percent, and I saw it 50 percent. I mean, I could bring it up. I don't know where it is, but getting back to this Avis, uh, you're looking at the short ratio increasing tremendously. When you see that, these shorts have to cover, right? So right now they short the stock, they have to buy back the stock to close the position. So when this goes higher and higher and higher, it's forcing them to buy back at any price to get the hell out of the position because you're, you're, you have unlimited risk because it can go three, four, nine thousand, ten thousand, whatever, go up and, and, and you're done, right? So these guys are running, running, running uh, with the force selling and just seeing this move, it, it just, the, the point here, Daniel, which is, the point we should be making is be careful shorting stocks. I mean, you can buy puts and stuff yep. like that. It, that's fine. But if you're shorting stocks, look out. Because it doesn't matter if it's a shitty stock. It doesn't matter the story. It doesn't matter whatever. But it, you know the way the market is manipulated today, where you could see a lot of this stuff. And that's what happened with GameStop. And that's what happened with AMC, where the Wall Street bed crowd saw the, the short position. They saw the options on it and the put. And, and they just they said, okay, once, we start, once this thing starts going on, it's going to keep going and going and going. And then you have this whole entire circle, which... You know, Wall Street bets, even Chamath said it right. It, it's, you know, one of the most powerful hedge funds, really, with those guys. I mean, look what they yeah. could do with some of these stocks. You know, you just have to be careful because your thesis, just no matter what. And I learned that from Disney. I mean, none of the fundamentals make sense. This stock should not be trading where it is at 40 times forward earnings when they're seeing declining growth. Their growth model that they went all in on is slowing tremendously. They have no pricing power. They don't have money to compete content wise with the rest of the guys, but yet it's still holding up pretty well. You, know, you learn this lesson. You got to adapt to the market, right? It doesn't matter if you see something, the fundamentals don't make sense. This is a shitty stuff. You could get wrecked right away by shorting stocks. But these moves, Daniel, are, are insane. I've never seen this. I've never seen, you know, stocks that are up 10, 15% go up 120%. We saw this with Naked Wines. Uh, Hedge Fund yeah. came on TV last week and mentioned it. It was at nine. It went to like, it, it was eight and it went to 19, I think, or nine, it went to 19. Within the five minutes, the guy was talking. 
saying this is going to be a 3X server three years from now. This is what we love. And he, he explains the thesis or whatever. And just the stuff just started going and going and going and going. And, and they were even saying, I'm like, wow, look at this thing. It was the quickest double. I mean, Josh Brown says the quickest double I've ever seen in my life. It was yep. like three to four minutes. It doubled. Now it's back down to 10. Holy shit. I mean, we're in a new age here, right? Uh, yes, for how long remains to be seen. But this definitely gives the Bears and your uh, old school investors a lot of ammo to just point to how Fed policies and different things make the markets into a giant casino. And it's hard to argue. I mean, how do you argue that uh, it's not gamification like Robin Hood and things like that when you have those stocks making those moves? So just take that, just, you know, keep that in mind as investors. Uh, there's, it's never a reason to be completely out of the game, like you said, Frank. But just kind of, you know, try to keep things in perspective as we uh, continue down the Willy Wonka and uh, Wizard of Ozville that we have. I yeah. got to turn to something. Just real quick before you turn, I just want to show the people these charts. This, this is uh, Avis. So Avis into the quarter, if you could see it here, this is uh, they put earnings. The stock closed one, uh, 171. Uh, then it opened at 186. Nice move. This 932. Uh, then it, it, it started going to, you know, it started going crazy. Uh, hit 200 uh, about 940, 945, and then from 945 to what time is this? Uh, looks like an hour later, 1050. The stock went to 535, <laughs> and then it came down. Now it's down to like 300 level, which is still a massive win from where it was 170. But God, yeah, I just want to show people how crazy that was, how insane it was. No, just in the in the same theme of hey, investors need to pay attention to some macro events when you're making decisions and things like that. Uh, Zillow reported rough earnings. Uh, Zillow, the you know home buyer flipping market. Now, did you did you go through any of these numbers, Frank? You know what? I'm reading the story everywhere. It's one of the things I didn't cover because we had Avis. I, I looked at, at Bed Bath and Beyond. We taped the CCI video yesterday, so you know, for me, I just read a couple of headlines and you were talking about. It. I said, hey, you know what? I, I, the algorithm, obviously, right? Everybody knows the algorithm didn't work and the losses, but you have the numbers behind it. I'm like, yeah, we got Well, there's this. stories everywhere, like you were pointing out, and they they missed. I mean, I think they missed estimates on earnings per share by over a dollar. They missed on revenue. Uh, but the big takeaway is, I don't know if you have this chart pulled up there. Look over the last several months, because that thing was just skyrocketing. Uh, as home prices continue to go higher, they've tapered off a little bit. Mortgages, you know, interest rates, things like that are moving higher. So that's all, you know, every investor is going to have to kind of take all this with a grain of salt. But- Listen to this stat. So how quickly things can change is what you need to take away from this. Their artificial intelligence, AI-powered housing flipping operation is over, Frank. They're done with it. They're trying to unload 7,000 homes for $2.8 billion. They've lost over $300 million on this program alone. Now, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback. So Daniel Creech isn't sitting here and telling you how stupid Zillow is and how dumb the executives are. I don't really blame them for trying to take take advantage of the market they were in, but this just shows you how you don't want to get over your skis and things. Because Phoenix, Arizona, Frank, which is where it's been the hottest, uh, I don't want to exaggerate, but it's been the leading housing market for a good while, several, however they report quarter over quarter or anything. But why would you get rid of a program, Frank? Well, what if 93% of the homes listed in the Phoenix area portfolio are underwater? Do you think that's a good idea to scrap a portfolio idea? <laughs> It, what, repeat that again? Frank, 93% of homes listed in their Phoenix area portfolio are underwater. How is that possible? Well, because you have these algorithms just buying things like crazy, and now you're trying to resell them. You're flipping yeah, But them. Even with their algorithms, with the with the data that that company has, which is more data than probably almost everyone else in a real estate industry, I mean, everything, the prices, what's being sold, what's bought. I mean, if you ever look at Zillow, it's an amazing site, right? It is an amazing site for, for homes. You can find out what the price of your home, every price around you. And just the data that they have in real time and what's going on, how you could find out immediately once people close on loans and how much you know, houses are selling for immediately. How the hell don't they get that algorithm right? How do they get it that freaking wrong? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I mean, they have more data than everybody. I, I would think that in that industry, I don't know, man. I, I, it just That's why it's getting hit, but- Real quick, before you go any further, because you told me to bring up the chart, I didn't know this about Zillow. It's a stock I haven't really followed. But this thing was trading at 200 in February. 200. And it's been in a massive downtrend since. And then it's kind of like, you know, the last month or so, it, it popped. It popped from like, uh, you know, 85 to, to 105. And I guess this is why you're seeing now it's 70. It's down 20%. But when you see this move higher on a technicals where people are saying, hey, this thing's starting to break out. It's starting to come out. And you're getting a lot of those traders in coming in. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere... 
it just switches gears and you report a terrible quarter. What happens is you see a massive, ex you know, just everyone exiting from the stock and the thing falling 19%. But this is on, you know, news that's serious. But again, again, I know you know more about this story than I do. Well, I'm just reading off a few. Um, yeah, I, I was just going through kind of the cliff notes. So they lost um, over $380 million on the program, which is called Zillow Offers. And Bloomberg reports that it might increase to around $560 million in losses. That, so what's the big takeaway here? Because we didn't recommend this. We didn't say to buy puts on it. We didn't say to buy it and get any of the run-up. We missed this, or at least I missed it on this front. My point is, is staying with this macro theme when you're looking at the price action in Avis and Bed Bath & Beyond, this doesn't mean that the real estate market is over. This doesn't mean that the big takeaway here is buy right. If you're looking at property or housing, buy right. Make sure that your risk reward is in your favor, whatever you believe. Nobody has a crystal ball, but don't just get caught up in the euphoria like this company did. They bought... Zillow bought 3,800 homes in the second quarter, Frank. That was towards their stated goal of acquiring 5,000 homes per month by 2024. Do you guys, do everybody down, I mean. I mean, well, yeah, because this is a fundamental what do you got to do after change, that? Right? What this choice is, do you have after that if you're an analyst? This, this is amazing, right? Because I see this with Zillow. They're getting out of this market, and, and this is their growth model. This is what they pitch as their growth model. How do we monetize our services, and how can we do it? Here's something, right? Let's go with these algorithms or whatever. And now you're seeing this is briefing.com with all the downgrades and stuff, but but downgraded from, from Truist, from, from Evercore, JMP Securities, Piper Sandler. You know, when you take away that growth uh, component, and now you really don't know, like, where's the growth coming from? And, and you got to go back to drawing board. It's crazy. I, it's, that's what amazes me, Daniel, right now about even when it comes to, to, to a company like Disney. With Disney, hey, they went all in on this growth model. Obviously, it's not working out as planned. They're seeing slower growth. They don't have pricing power in it, which they're seeing. Uh, and, and now you're like, okay, what are they going to do? And, and the fact that their best content is Marvel, and they cannot put that on streaming. They got to put it after it comes out to the movies because these things generate a billion, much more than a billion dollars. That that's the, the you know. Well, a, a huge, huge sales driver and also uh, an earning driver for the company. And, and you can't put that on streaming. That's the greatest content that they have. So, uh, yeah, it's just amazing that you wouldn't see this for some stocks. But this is where what happens when a, a company just has a growth model and then it's almost like a biotech stock where you're in phase two and everything looks good. And that stock is run up higher because you went phase one and phase two looks good. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, it didn't meet our endpoint and we're getting rid of this and we're not focusing on it. That biotech, if that's the only drug in its pipeline, is going to go down to what the net cash is. And that could be 70, 80, 90%. You don't know. But Zillow here coming down, it's hard to even recommend it and say it's oversold, which it might be. But you need to have some kind of growth model of what you're going to do. And, and they didn't say that. They're not saying, hey, what's the growth? And that's why analysts are like, we don't know what, what you're going to do now. What's the next step in, in growth? Yeah. And like you said, it's in a big downtrend. I think it's down 15. It was down 15% when we started this. So it's, it's getting hit today. And as it should. I mean, you know, you report bad numbers, that's okay. Uh, things are going to go down. The takeaway here also is I like this great separation theme you were on yesterday, Frank, because especially for us to be completely selfish as newsletter writers and podcasters and things like that, man, are we, how long have we been wanting the market and companies to trade on their own will? Yeah. I mean, everything going up and everything going down is good in a sense, but as stock pickers and people that want to help individual investors navigate through this kind of stuff, you know, you want to see good news means good news. Bad news means bad news. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to quickly go into the Fed? Do you think they're going to say anything you that's know, not we'll, we'll expected today? We'll do the Fed really, really quick here because basically they're going to announce that they're going to taper later today. Uh, and Well, they're going to announce the program they're not starting today they're going to announce, yeah, they're, they're today gonna that they're announce gonna it yeah. but the thing it's funny because they made it clear that tapering is not tightening <laughs> actually said that tapering is not like it, it's almost like you're so addicted to, to easy monetary policy that you don't have the balls to come out and just say it you just you, why is a fed so afraid to tighten it, it it's it's not a bad thing if you're tightening. I mean, it shows that you have the economy underneath you to support something like that. You see an inflation run wild. If this bill does pass through through Congress and, and, and gets approved, President signs it, uh, you're going to see inflation beyond belief. I mean, we can't get products anywhere right now. And, and you're seeing that even with the holiday season. But again, the separation, Mattel, I, I love that Mattel came out and said, hey, the things Under Armour, Under Armour came out. I mean, Nike last quarter. I think they still yet to report Nike. But last quarter, they said China growth slow and inventory concerns. MP Under Armour came out and said, nope, our margins are going higher, so they have pricing power. Uh, no inventory concerns. Uh, you know, No supply chain concerns that they worry about. And they raised guidance. And that's going to re-rate. It did re-rate, and that stock popped. That's one of the ones in our mm -hmm. portfolio. This that That's going to take off. It is 
for them, because now you're seeing separation. We'll see what Nike reports, because that stock and credit to Goldman, Goldman recommended and, and, and initiated coverage on them with a buy rating at 150 after they, they kind of bombed the quarter. And the stock has been coming up, coming up into its highs. Man, Nike's a scary stock heading into the quarter. I mean, they better report really good numbers because this stock is moving up on a terrible quarter where they had supply chain issues. They better blow out the numbers. And they're the best company in the world at manipulating their earnings. I've covered that for a while. They're great uh, in terms of tax rates and, and little things. And, and again, they're, they're amazing at it. It's legal. They do it better than anybody else. Everybody kind of does it and, and, and you know, just promotes it the way our accounting systems and you have to report every quarter. But it's going to be interesting to see because if they do not find a way to really beat earnings, that stock is going to get hit because it's running up to its all-time highs now on a very bad quarter where expectations are sky high. But Under Armour came out and said, hey, things are great. Just like yeah. Intel was shitty. But if you Beaten look raise, at yeah. AMD was great. So you've seen the separation, which I like. And, and you know, two things I wanted to talk about. The Fed, I don't think that's that big of a deal, right? I mean, it's they're going to come out and, and, and taper and, and announce it. But you know, it's going to be very, very small. It's not a big deal. But yeah, listen, the Fed's pedal to the metal. They're going to keep it that way. They're not going to, you know change that right no uh not at all real quick on nike i do think that they uh it doesn't surprise me that goldman did that um you know after a pullback i do believe nike gets the benefit of the doubt nike is like facebook to me um i have some of their products because i get them at a discount here and there and um you know that's okay however they do get the benefit of the doubt to turn the ship i mean nike isn't nike isn't a poorly run company they're smart guys like you said they can do all the uh legal legal accounting stuff to make their numbers look great but i would uh for again so i would buy it ahead of earnings you would not buy it right i would not buy it ahead of earnings okay. it's right i would go on blind like that just because that's i i give them the benefit of the doubt on the name brand and what they do i mean hell, yeah. just do i it. love How the biggest is thing is that i love the fact that you call it nike and uh, nike or nike yeah because i mispronounce everything I mean, okay, and everybody calls me out on it i love it so once they call me out on it, it means i have to pronounce it wrong for the rest of my life because i'm going to make sure it's a purpose i think i was calling uh the the Bach, it's Bach exchange. It's B A K K T. I was like Bach, the Bach exchange. They're like, no, it's Bach. Now oh. I gotta call it Bach forever, right? So yeah. <laughs> he's gonna stick with me. But you know, when the, it, guys be careful when when, I, when you it, it's to me this is classic with Nike where you, it's running up into the quarter off of a bad quarter off of bad numbers. Uh, yes, there's conservative guidance going in. They report next month. They report a month from now. Uh, and the stock's approaching all time high after reporting a bad quarter, meaning they better meet expectations. If they do, you'll probably see the stock pop, you know, three to five percent. If they don't, you could see a 10, 12, 15 percent pullback. To me, the risk reward of just buying that into the, the quarter doesn't make sense. But then again, I would have said the same thing for Avis and it went up 125, 200 yeah. percent. And we have in the portfolio. But that's why even when you're up on stocks, guys, the best thing I could tell you, the biggest lesson is I've sold stocks way, way too early. Take some off the table where you don't care, where you, you just made a lot of it. It could be 100% where your cost basis is zero. It could be 2 300% and that thing's running higher. Take a little bit off. Uh, and, and now you have money to put into a lot of your other ideas and just let it ride. Because think about the people who sold Amazon 10 years ago or Microsoft seven years ago, uh, you know, thinking it's expensive where you, you don't know. You really don't know where some of these things could go. And that's how you make fortunes, right? That's how you really, really make fortunes because uh, most people sell out early and they take their profits and, and gains. But let a little bit ride because you never know where these things go. And if it falls 10, 20, 30 percent from there, you don't care because you cashed out already. And, you know, then you can decide to sell it or whatever. But now you're in a stock for the long term that has a lot of potential. And uh, that's the best advice I can give on that. But coming to the end here, Daniel, but I wanted to touch up on, on two things. And one of them real quick was a news from JP Morgan, which I thought was a big deal, where they're banning everything pot related where clients can't trade it through their banking system and everything, right? I mean, I thought that was that was pretty significant and news that's kind of under the radar. Well, this is out of Reuters. Um, they're banning select cannabis names. So there was a couple. It says the move follows similar actions by other banks. So Credit Suisse. Swiss? Swiss? Swiss, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having Same. fun with you there. That's cool. Uh, so private fund. Arco, Arco's Capital and, you know, big banks took a lot of big hits off that, you know, huge losses. So they're going to restrict that. Uh, they, they keep saying, I, I was skimming through here. It didn't say a lot of the names. I can't imagine they're going to take away like Canopy Growth and, and some of the major ones. Uh, but they just said they're limiting to some cannabis related names. And this highlights that, hey, you know, you still have this overhang of it's still illegal uh, at the federal level, even though they're choosing not to enforce it. And JP Morgan put out a a wonderful, you know, PR statement saying, "Hey, they're doing everything uh, according to U.S. money laundering laws and regulations." Basically, this is all going to be 
in the idea or wrapped around the idea of doing good for you as the consumer, just like what we saw with GameStop and people, you know, increasing margin rates and you're not allowed to bet against it short. Mm -hmm. TD Ameritrade did the same thing. Um, So it's just kind of a fun fact to see there. You know, I haven't seen marijuana stocks in the news at all. I haven't been following them lately, and it's just it's kind of surprising to see this come across well, the desk. It, they're like this cyclical during like election times of what states are going to approve them, right? I followed the industry for a while. Uh, now it's kind of boring. But what this tells me, J.P. Morgan, I mean, Jamie Dimon is more connected to anyone in the world, probably, and I mean anyone in the world. I mean, when it comes to polit- politicians, when it comes to, to the Fed, everything. Uh, for him to, to make this announcement and, and stop letting clients invest in pot stocks tells me this is never going to get approved on the federal level. It just won't get approved. And a lot of people believe never? that that will Frank, happen. Never? Frank, are you saying never? Uh, uh, a guy like this who runs the biggest bank in the world has the inside scoop, and it's all about money. That's why he's even getting into Bitcoin. It's a two and a half, almost $3 trillion market. They have no choice, right? Well, and, plus well, and what they're doing, let me interrupt, I'm sorry, is they're they're limiting it to, it looks like outside U.S. sales, you know, so they're trying the to restriction. just- The restriction. They're just trying to cut it down to say, hey, these yeah. are the people doing it right. And but to your point, it's about money. It's also risk on their end, but it's about money and regulations yeah, in the United States. And even States. for us too, where, uh, you know, again, it's approved on the state level, but not on the federal level, meaning that, you know, the FBI could go into a state and even in Colorado and, and close a business down if they want, <laughs> even though, because, yeah. you know, that supersedes- state laws but uh to me that even computer share which we're using as a transfer agent now when we transfer over to t0 for our token a ceo token currency equity owners token which is going to be trading in a couple weeks there uh computer share said that we had to sign a document saying like you know you have no pot related not pot related recommendations that we're not going to have a pot related company or anything like that so they're all companies that are against it i just yeah probably not good news for the pot industry uh you know, again, you, you want momentum there. You p- might get momentum going into to, you know, when it's election time and some states are going to prove and they have that adopted. That's when, you, you know, you'll see a pop in these things. But I was surprised in that news. And the last thing, since we got a minute left here, is uh, Metaverse, right? We're seeing, you know, Facebook change its name. You had some amazing points on Facebook. I've always said how this company is incredible, but you have some stats on Facebook that were incredible. And, and I just want to talk about that really quick because there's a company that we recommend in our in our um, crypto intelligence newsletter called Decentraland. I'll give that away because it went up like three, four hundred percent. Pull back a little bit from that, but this is like in a week, right? This is what because if you want to know more about the meta, this company has it set up already. Go to that site. You can create a character. I did it live. I, I you know, I showed the video and stuff like that. And this thing went up, but you're going to get a better indication because there's more and more companies pouring into this. But also with Facebook, I mean, Facebook's going to be a key player in this. Obviously, changing the name to there, and, and, and you know, just to show you how big Facebook is, Dan. I know you, you talk about some statistics. When I, <laughs> I just started laughing. Yeah, this was in the, this morning's Wall Street Journal, and this is just huge. This is from the section heard on the street, and so I'm just going to highlight this one number and show you why you have to pay attention to this metaverse thing. So Wall Street forecasts total advertising revenue for the company, formerly called Facebook, of course, will reach $114 billion this year. That's 17% of the entire global market. And that's 10 times the amount projected for social media competitors, Twitter, Snap, and Pinterest combined. I knew they were the head and shoulders leader and above everybody else. I didn't realize that it was that big when you combine that. Now, I say that, that stood out to me because they're driving the force. We talked last week about how uh, Zuckerberg wants to get hundreds of billions of dollars in digital revenue a day going onto this platform. And one last thing on Nike, uh, also in today's Wall Street Journal, is Nike filed trademark to sell digital shoes, Frank. Now, they didn't come out and say Metaverse with it. It's more on the NFTs inside, but it's not a long extension to say, just like when you were walking around in your little Metaverse world when you Mm. were your character, you got Coca-Cola products, you can have Nike products, designers, everything. So, uh, again, just... Start learning about it. Start learning about it. Just buy a little bit of Facebook, you know. You can blame Daniel Creech if you're wrong, but have some exposure to that. And if you own any kind of a fund, you have exposure to Facebook because they're in everything. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, Daniel, listen, uh, got a lot out, talked a lot lot about a lot of different stocks, guys. Uh, Earnings season's almost coming to to an end, but, uh, you know, we're going to break it down every week. Small Cap's going to be reporting a lot more over the next two weeks, which is a lot of fun. So we'll be breaking that down. I see tremendous opportunity in that industry, which I said yesterday, this podcast. But, Dan, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it, bud. Cheers, everyone. (laughs) All right. I'll see you next week. Actually, I'll see you in five minutes but in the rest of the week. But everyone else will see you next week. And uh, guys, thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Really appreciate all the support. And I will see you guys tomorrow with an awesome, awesome interview. So I'll see you then. Take care.